And in particular, we need to have a settlement for social care as well as a settlement for the NHS if we're going to be able uh, to deliver a proper health and care system. But having said that, I do think it, 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 with, throughout the health service and people who rely on it, it's good news that we have a more uh, clearer forward look as to the amount of money that's available. So that's the answer to your first question. Well, yeah, well, here, so, so here, here we have these 17 operations. I've got them in front of me. Um, look, they're, they're not going to happen anymore. Snoring surgery. This is a quality of life versus money question. All of these are, aren't they, really? Because if you've got a real snoring problem, even if it only goes away for five or ten years, that's, uh, that, that's kind of great news for your quality of life. But you're not going to be able to get that on the NHS anymore. Is that okay? Well, I don't think that's actually quite what the, uh, the article says. I think there's quite a, there's uh, clearly the, the uh, proposals from NHS England have been written up by journalists, and that's normal in the public debate about these things. But I do think it's very important to separate in the health service two issues. Uh, of course, it's true that when you're responsible for, for managing a large sum of public money, as NHS England is, uh, there will be choices to be made. You can't do everything. Of course, that's true. Uh, but it is also true uh, that there are some things going on where clinical practice changes, new procedures become available, or new evidence becomes available. And I do think NHS England are to be congratulated, actually, uh, for facing up to the fact that some of these uh, procedures uh, simply don't, are not supported by evidence that they deliver what's claimed for them. And you, you, in your introduction, you talked about grommets. Uh, which uh, neither of us are great experts, you know, neither you nor I hmm. uh, have ever done a grommet operation. No. But I can tell you that there's been questions over the clinical effectiveness of the insertion of grommets for as long as I've been involved in this sector, which is over 25 years now. And it does seem to me that if you're using, if you're using public money, uh, you shouldn't, uh, and, and you're responsible for outcomes for patients, you shouldn't be doing surgery or offering procedures uh, where there are question marks over whether the procedure is effective. Well, that, but, it, but it's also how, how do you decide what's effective and what isn't? For instance, over a five to a ten year period, if you've got carpal tunnel and you can buy five years of, of pain-free existence after an operation, if you, can, if you can have that operation on the NHS now, but the threshold is to become higher as far as I can see, um, that's not going to be available anymore. So that is a restriction of what has given a great deal of satisfaction to people in the path. And, and there's one other one, Stephen, a similar example example, Dupatron's contracture, and I've got that in both my, um, my hands, mm. and, and I'm hoping to have a, an injection, possibly a, a procedure to, to follow that. It, it appears that um, this may not be um, automatically open to me. It says here only exceptional circumstances. So in a way, there is a tightening of availability, isn't it? And is that to be welcomed? Well, I think what's to be welcomed is uh, the um, insistence by the medical director of the NHS that if procedures are going to be un uh, you know, offered to patients, uh, the NHS should first satisfy itself that the procedure is going to be effective. Uh, I don't deny, and it's important not to be heard to deny, of course it's true, uh, that there are choices to be made of, about priorities. Uh, but even within that, uh, we shouldn't be putting even onto the list of priorities to be chosen from things that aren't effective. And your question, how do you decide what's effective? Mm -hmm. Well, that's, what, that's why uh, the National Institute for Clinical Excellence, NICE, that's why it was set up, uh, set up in the early years of the Labour government. We opposed it when I was health secretary. We were wrong to do so. Uh, NICE has established a reputation for looking at the evidence and determining what is effective. I think that's a, it's important to do that, and it's important to use the evidence that's provided by NICE about what is effective and what is... Well, that's a very good question over the next uh, 45 minutes or so, Stephen Doral, as I, as I sort of uh, let you go. Not, not now, after the, after the next question, the, the last one. You know, what, what, what is effective, and do you have to measure it against finance? It's 03456060973. Um, Stephen, you're chair of the NHS Confederation. You're a former health secretary as well. 
you are involved in um, in a in a healthcare company called you a consultancy. Is that Langwisson? Is that the way you say it? That's right. Yeah, Langwisson. Do you do you provide private medical care, or is it just analysis and um, and, and data with the company? Because this is going to drive people into the hands of of private companies even more. And we've got four million people with private medical at the moment. I mean, surely that is the uh, inevitable consequence of all this. Well, the answer to your question is language is an economics consultancy. I see. We, we provide data about what's going on in the, in the private health and care space. Uh, does this lead to uh, patients leaving the health service and taking private care? If the evidence is that the treatment is ineffective, frankly, it doesn't matter whether the taxpayer pays for it or the patient pays for it. It's not good medical care. Mm. All right. Well, Stephen Darrell, thank you very much.